This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University, and today I wanted to talk about how the U.S. Constitution is a ship coin. It's just an altcoin, and this is meant as a follow-up to yesterday's video about Argentina's central bank banning the use of Bitcoin by banks and financial services apps and companies in Argentina. I'll link to this in the description notes below if you want to watch it. But I wanted to make this as a follow-up, lest my fellow American viewers feel a little bit too smug after watching that video about the relative stability of the U.S. system. So anyone who's been watching this channel for any length of time knows that I'm a big fan of America's founding fathers and the foresight they had, the vision they had. I'm a big fan of the U.S. Constitution, especially the First and Second, probably the Fourth Amendment as well. But here's the big problem. When there's a big crisis, whether real or pretend, being pretended by the government, the rule book gets completely thrown out. Free speech disappears, property rights disappear, and the US Constitution is suddenly not worth the paper that it's written on. An example of this is Executive Order 6102 of 1933. This was when President Roosevelt confiscated all Americans' gold. You could keep a small token amount of gold. Maybe you could keep your wedding ring or something like this. But if your gold was left in a bank, bank vault, it was all it was all confiscated and you were paid a very low price for it. And then the U.S. dollar was revalued and uh, your gold would have been worth a lot more if you'd been allowed to hold on to it. So in a, in a crisis situation like this, you can forget all about property rights. It doesn't matter if it's the land of the free and the home of the brave. In 1933, Americans may have thought that they were just storing their hard-earned savings in gold, but then FDR, President Roosevelt, told them that they were quote-unquote hoarding. There's always the language games that are used against people by politicians. And in this case, of course, the New York Times sided with power, with the powers that be, against the American people, as it always does. I'll link to this article about the hoarding of gold from the New York Times from April 6th, 1933, where they basically go along with what the president uh, called the hoarding of gold, rather than pointing out that this was private property, this was the savings of all these people. I'll also link to this Wikipedia article about Executive Order 6102, and even this points out that the main rationale behind the order was actually to remove the constraint on the Federal Reserve, preventing it from increasing the money supply because the dollar had to be backed by a certain amount of gold. So again, when it comes to a crisis situation, central bankers are much more powerful than the Constitution. In 1933, the U.S. also defaulted on its bonds. This was something that was pushed by the White House, pushed by the executive branch and President Roosevelt. Congress and the Supreme Court supported him. So, so much for the balance of powers between the legislative and the executive and the judicial branches. They were all in on this. And what happened here is U.S. bondholders had been promised that they could redeem their bonds for gold. These were mostly bonds that were issued to finance World War I. But in this case, all three branches of the U.S. government broke that promise. Bondholders, U.S. bondholders got paid back, just not with gold. They got paid back with devalued paper money. And I'll link to this article that goes a little bit more into it in the description notes below. But basically what Congress did is they said that promising to pay these bondholders back with gold went against current public policy. And so the U.S. government didn't have to do it. And this was actually help upheld by the Supreme Court as well. We had another example in 1967, 1968, when silver certificates, which look a lot like dollar bills, but they're actually, if you look at the top, it says silver certificate. These were initially redeemable for silver dollar coins and then later for raw silver bullion. But starting in June of 1968, you could no longer redeem them for silver itself. You could only redeem them with Federal Reserve notes. So that was 1968. It's just a couple years later, three years later, when under the Nixon shock, President Nixon canceled the convertibility of the U.S. dollar into gold. And this was another form of soft default where a lot of the allies were holding uh, U.S. dollars thinking that they could get gold, they could exchange those dollars for gold at any time. And what Nixon did is severed this convertibility and really helped us enter, unfortunately, the modern fiat era. So these are many, many examples. These are all metallic, metal-backed, commodity-backed currency examples. And all of these defaults took place when the U.S. was still 
on a gold standard, which raises the question, will the U.S. default on its debt this May or June of 2023? Absolutely not. There's a lot of political theater. I think there's probably somewhere between a zero and 1% chance that there's actually a default in terms of a hard default where the U.S. does not pay back principal or make interest payments on its debt. But we're in a very different situation here because U.S. dollar is not tied to gold. In the old days, you had to actually come up with that gold to pay people back. But these days, we, we uh, the Fed, as Bernanke said, possesses this horrible modern technology called a printing press, and they can just print up dollars. There's no debt that can be issued by the U.S. Treasury that can't be bought up by the Fed using freshly printed monopoly money, in other words, worthless fiat dollars. So this is what the U.S. has been doing. They've been doing a soft default for years. Bondholders always get paid back but they get paid back with increasingly worthless U.S. dollars. So you may make you may be making 4 or 5% on your treasury note, but inflation is always much higher than that. And by the time it's time for your principal to be redeemed, you get paid back the par value, the face value, $10,000 or whatever it is, or $1,000, whatever it is, but that you, those U.S. dollars are worth a lot less. So this is the form that defaults take for reserve currency countries like the U.S. And we can see that the U.S. dollar, ever since the founding of the Federal Reserve, has seen the erosion of the purchasing power of the dollar. And it just goes on and on and on. This is why I've been calling the U.S. Constitution a ship coin, because when you need it most, the U.S. Constitution is really a worthless piece of paper. It's a ship coin. In a proclaimed state of emergency, you have zero rights. In a real or pretend crisis, it doesn't matter what country you live in or what supposed rights you have. You won't have any rights when you need them most. Only if you've planned ahead and secured those future rights will you have food, water, maybe a piece of land, a garden, tools of self-defense, and then bare asset money that's no one else's liability. Bitcoin would be the main example of this. If someone wants to hold a little bit of gold as well, I can't really argue against that, even though I only hold Bitcoin. I don't hold any gold. I personally rather hold tools of self-defense, water, food, and land instead of that gold. In a state of emergency, expect the banks to be closed for weeks, months, maybe years. Roosevelt closed the banks for a couple weeks back in the 1930s. We already know from really recent history what lockdowns and movement passports and these sort of totalitarian things look like. At the end of the day, just as we didn't really have constitutional protections in 2020 and 2021 for many things, at the end of the day, don't expect the U.S. Constitution to protect you if we have a severe banking crisis, a severe financial crisis, or if the government manufactures a crisis in order to gain more control over the population. Only Bitcoin won't fail you in a crisis. And this is why I say cryptography is greater than a constitution. Bitcoin is greater than ship coins. If you're relying on the police, if you're relying on the military, if you trust your politicians to protect you in a time of crisis, you are living on a foundation of sand. Make sure you have some Bitcoin and make sure you're prepared as we expect this decade to become increasingly volatile. We don't exactly know what direction it's going to take. Hopefully the U.S. can transition smoothly to a Bitcoin standard. But even if we do that, I think there'll be a lot of volatility in the coming year. So think a lot about the Constitution. It's not really there when you need it most. It's much better to have your private property rights secured by the Bitcoin network and secured by cryptography. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.